Support for the Civic Sci TV network comes from viewers, readers, and listeners like you, and organizations such as the Berlin Science Week and the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Visit civicsci.tv.org to learn more about our network of programs. Exploring societal challenges through the lens of civic science. This is the Perspective Program with host Dia Dwarakanath. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dia Dwarakanath. Today, we're discussing public health, specifically environmental exposure, and how researchers and community scientists are working together to improve it. We have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Ryan Sinclair, a research professor of environmental microbiology at Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California. Dr. Sinclair focuses on community science initiatives for environmental exposure to things like air and water pollutants. One example is the project he led at nearby Salton Sea in Eastern Coachella Valley. Welcome. Hi, Dia, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for being here. All right, let's connect the dots. First, some quick definitions. What is exposure science? So exposure science is a field of study and a field of um, approaching um, sometimes environmental justice problems. And what it is, it's how we as humans are exposed to contaminants and even other things. Um, and it's quantifying the actual pathways of that exposure. So how am I exposed to methyl mercury in fish that I'm eating? How am I exposed to arsenic in drinking water? How am I exposed to, um, you know, hantavirus in an old uh, shack with a lot of dust? You know, so um, it really kind of quantifies that out of body part of um, science. So there's the pathogenesis and when the disease uh, symptoms that you, you experience, but the exposure science is everything in the environment. Um, and it fits really well into the framework for environmental health risk assessment. It's the exposure assessment part of it. Okay, okay. And um, besides environmental justice, are there other key concepts the audience should know to understand this topic? Sure. Um, you know, exposure science is really, um, it's really interdisciplinary. So you can approach it from healthcare, you can approach it from environmental sciences, from public health, from anthropology. I, I work with some geographers and anthropologists on a project at the Salton Sea right now, that's our current project, that's NASA funded. And they're looking at um, perceptions of exposure to hydrogen sulfide. And that, that's also an exposure science study. It's just um, on the social science side. So yeah, there's a lot of different disciplines that cross into exposure science. Okay, okay, great. And I read about the two key principles of your lab on your website. Can you explain those and share your theory of change around this area? Oh, um, can you can you remind me again what those were? Um, oh, I, yes. yes. I think um, they were around centering um, underserved populations and um, and the community itself in the research that you do. And um, choosing research questions that are related to that. So, so why is that important to you? And, and can you talk a little bit about the theory of change there? Oh yeah, sure. Thanks for, for bringing that up. I, I have a lot of things on my website, so I was wondering what, what it was, but um, I yeah. uh, definitely one of the core reasons why we do this is to be able to approach um, a community that um, experiences a lot of different um, and a lot more exposures to um, contaminants than the rest of us. Like um, I, I'm, I live in a privileged life and a lot of people in the US and California don't have as many privileges as some of the rest of us um, as far as the environment that they live in. Some environments are more challenging to live in than other environments. And so that's part of the reason why I, I do exposure science and why I work um, where I work. Um, so um, that also highlights what environmental justice is. Environmental justice is ultimately highlighting this disparity between people who are exposed to some pretty serious contaminants and those who are not. And what are those social factors, why they're exposed? What are the, um, the political factors, the policy factors of why people are exposed? Those are all other things to think about. I end up with this approach getting into those things. I get into the policy a little bit. I get into the, 
the sociology a little bit, anthropology, but I try to keep I try to keep my exposure science hat on as much as possible. But in order to communicate any kind of science, you really have to center it on the people there. You have to go out there and be able to um, help them, facilitate them to um, amplify what their concerns are. If I go out there with my own um, research interests, which I have many research interests, you know, like I get super nerdy about a lot of different things in the environment. But one of the challenges to, you know, kind of center it on what people are wanting me to do rather than what I want to do. And that's a, that is a challenge both uh, professionally and, you know, even in a hobby sort of way, like, um, professionally because you know I'm an academic scientist and what happens is that you you end up setting your research trajectory on an idea that you think will bring in funding and continue your sustainability as a professor and continue a, a funding stream and continue like a professional development um, stream of, of papers and topics that you can just keep building through your career well um, going and doing this kind of serving the community on these topics it's also possible to do that but you really have to jump in and and uh, try to make it work with intentional um, attention to hearing what they say first and amplifying the topics that they want to talk about. I see. And I noticed that in the recent paper that you published on this work, it said, you know, research questions were designed to address concerns raised by residents of the environmental impacts you know, of the Salton Sea. And that does sound like a very new and different approach to, to designing a research question than what I might have typically read in, in a paper, in an, in an academic paper. Yeah, and, and the thing with the community science I'm doing now, I would say I'm on like the third sort of broad area of science at the Salton Sea that the community has directed. The first one was this paper that just came out, which was to look at the shoreline, redu uh, the, the reduction of the shoreline and the, the playa and the air quality issues around that community really wanted to know, like, why is the Salton Sea shrinking? How fast is it shrinking? So we quantified the rate of change and we use balloon mapping and all of this. And this was all community science. The second one was like, OK, well, that's interesting. And then let's move to the water quality. What's going on with that? And it's this nutrients coming in. And then the third one, of course, is people are now really wanting us to work on um, hydrogen sulfide issues. And that's the, the gases that are released from the Salton Sea. And that is um, kind of the third uh, iteration of our community science work out there. Okay. And what have you learned so far in, in each iteration? What has surprised you maybe in, in what you've learned? Well, um, a lot of different things. The first one, um, these sort of anecdotes I have of working with community members and youth especially uh, and going out and you have this nice process of balloon mapping. Um, it's kind of hard to describe here, but this thing that I have hanging above my head is actually called a picave and it's something that hangs underneath a balloon. Um, and what happens is it balances a camera and you set the camera up to take pictures consecutively for like, you know, every five seconds or so. And then you, you put them all together and then you have a nice map. So, bringing kids from the high school, the nearby high school within like three miles or from the neighborhoods nearby the Salton Sea, bringing them to the shoreline and walking along the shore and then realizing that these kids are so interested and they're so knowledgeable, but they haven't actually been to the Salton Sea before and they grew up here. So that was kind of something. And that is how I really got drawn to the place um, because you know, the media portrays the Salton Sea so much and there's so much baggage that the media and that popular media and, you know, local agencies put on the Salton Sea and these kids are hearing it all and that keeps them away. And, you know, it's a it's an amazing place that it, it's like a, a, an amazing natural wonder that's out there. And I just, you know, like opening people's eyes and, and just being able to facilitate some of that and get people out there to start exploring and wondering what's going on. Um, and then um, just being able to do that and then realizing, hey, we're at the end of a phase here. The Salton Sea was, the reduction was coming along and then it started dropping and then it started dropping a lot. And we were at one of those junctions right there and being able to see it at this local area where we were doing the balloon mapping because there was something called a yacht club. It's still there and it had a bay 
And to see that point in 2018 when we first started, that bay is now like isolated from the Salton Sea. And just to see how far away that bay is from the Salton Sea. Um, it's it's kind of neat um, to see that and appreciate it. And then to bring community along to also appreciate that. I don't know if that's um, what you're looking for, but definitely, um, you know, just just having solidarity with people out there and working with them on just appreciating how, like how fast this, the shoreline is redu re reducing. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, ha engaging the, the community members with the actual local um, sea there is part of, I think, one of those things that you had learned. So, so that's really that's really interesting to me. So, who did you partner with to do the community science work? And it sounds like the community scientists did the balloon mapping. Um, what aspects of the research did they work on, and what did you work on, and how did you kind of pull that together? You know, with any community science, I was telling you this before off the camera. There's kind of a spectrum of participation. You have on one side, um, you have people that are um, just doing engagement, uh, sorry, uh, education. And then the other side, you have complete, like the community is driving the, the project. And we try to go all the way there. I would say our balloon mapping was almost there, but not nearly as close as our current project is. Um, so with balloon mapping, community definitely went out and would take the uh, balloon around and collect photos. Um, and then what happened was COVID and people were, there was a stay at home order. So that was like right at sort of the end of the project. Um, so we actually went out a little bit without community for a couple of trips. And so it wasn't for that reason, I'm saying it's not all the way there, the perfect community science, um, hundred percent, but, um, but collecting the photos, and then processing the photos, those are things that were community we were doing. But then the modeling of the shoreline reduction, that was sort of what we did in the lab afterwards. Um, so that's why that project is a little bit um, out of the three projects. That one was the starter. And, you know, it could have gone a little farther to be like full engagement, full participation. But um, we had COVID, we had some other challenges, but it kind of like also, you know, woke me up on, you know, what's necessary. So that was with a group called Alianza Coachella Valley, and they have a website, and they are um, uh, a group, Alianza, a group of other nonprofits in the valley, and they have pretty tight uh, relationships with youth and pretty tight relationships with agencies around. So that's who I still work with out there, and um, they're growing, and uh, that's that, that's the group that I work with. So we actually were going to the schools, and we we're going to the um, local even churches and parks and things and doing this, um, getting people there and bringing them down to the shore. Boys and Girls Club, that kind of thing. Okay, okay. So um, Alianza was one of your partners and like how how did you connect with them or get connected? Oh, uh, yeah, good question. Before that, I, I was working out there. When I first started working here about 12 years ago at the university, 13, 14 years ago, I'm afraid to say, but, um, you know, I was, I have this idea that I want, I need to partner with people or else, you know, how am I going to make my research relevant and how am I going to um, do something that's, um, uh, that I can have, you know, sustain me as a sort of community oriented, uh, bench scientist, I guess you could say. And so I am, went out there within a year or two to this to the eastern coachella valley and i started meeting some ngos and nonprofits out there who are working in drinking water which is something that i'm trained in and i started working with them and still we still do drinking water research um, on arsenic with some different organizations out there leadership council for justice and accountability is another one um, and they're just really well connected there's i've noticed that with these different zones where there's environmental justice problems, sometimes the community has a lot of solidarity with each other, has a lot of cohesiveness. And Eastern Coachella Valley definitely does. There's a lot of organizations, there's a lot of different nonprofits working. Um, other areas, maybe not so much. People aren't as um, outgoing. It's just the personality of the different areas. But Eastern Coachella Valley, it has a lot of different organizations and nonprofits and uh, even agencies that are um, empowered for whatever reason, cultural reasons, I'm not sure. Um, but it is it is kind of a neat place for that. There's other hot spots like that. I think that Oakland has pretty good um, community groups working in some places around um, Fresno and in the Central Valley. Um, but, you know, um, other places that are also disadvantaged populations may not have that as much. 
uh, Boyle Heights in LA is definitely, you know, they're pretty cohesive. So you can kind of like, you, you know, the famous places where there's environmental justice issues and where there's like really active, like really strong personalities and NGOs and nonprofits and things. Um, so Eastern Coachella Valley definitely is. And that's how I started working out there. And then I knew this organization, Alianza, before um, they were actually called Alianza. They were funded through the California Endowment. And I worked with them on a project before um, the current projects. And it's kind of just folded into that. Okay. So, yeah, like a long-term kind of partnership and engagement with with people in the area. And um, I guess one important question is what um, was the biggest challenge in community data collection? What kind of adaptations maybe to the technical aspects of like the res of, a, of a typical research process did you have to make, if any? What were, uh, yeah, let's start with the challenges and then move to maybe the successes. Well, um, I would say um, a lot of things cause challenges in community science. Um, but some of the funnest challenges to talk about are probably this uh, latest project we have where we're looking at nutrients and we're still monitoring for nutrients in um, the Salton Sea because it involves using a boat and because it's boats and such a large sea is really weather dependent. So um, some of the challenges are definitely the receding shoreline and launching the boat. Launching the boat is a topic that we're always talking about. Maybe 20, 25 years ago, there were actual boat launch ramps. And since that time, they're all kind of in the desert without, you know, they don't have any um, use because there's no water there. So you drive past those. And in one place, you have to drive past a boat ramp and you go another mile. I don't launch from that site, but that's that's down in the Red Hill Bay area. Um, but where we launch from, we, you know, those sites are always moving. So it's always a challenge. And every season, it feels like you have to go find a better place because otherwise you get stuck in the mud and you really get stuck in the mud at Salton Sea. And so that's the most okay. fun of a challenge to talk about. The other challenge is, of course, um, uh, getting your voice heard, you know, and we've come up with different strategies to to do that. I mean, that's what the nonprofit is all about. Okay. Okay. What What are some of those strategies or what advice would you give what actionable advice would you give other researchers trying to do similar work? Like how do, how can they overcome some of these challenges? Oh, definitely. Um, well, the boat challenge is kind of a fun challenge because you're, yeah. you, know, you just have to get really involved in looking at, you know, where you can launch from, where you can make the project happen. And that's, I think what a lot of scientists like to think about is like, how do you make this physical thing happen? The policy challenge, um, working with the agencies. Now that's something that's much more complicated. Um, I always thought like, you know, with drinking water, the engineering for the drinking water device, when you're bringing it overseas, like for the, you know, different, different disaster relief things, it's always easier to design the engineering for the actual drinking water removal than it is to actually implement the thing in the community. So the policy is very challenging. And so we've tried lots of different things. Um, not, not this group, but another group I work with is better with like direct action, like um, signs and things that they're not making any headway into what they're wanting to do. But Alianza Coachella Valley is really um, focused on uh, uh, success oriented sort of policy. And so they um, they are having us go to as scientists and as the community members, we go to all of the different agency meetings and we try to present and we try to um, uh, be transparent about what we're doing, but also insist that our science is also science that's collected, that's just as valid, just as important as the, the agency science. And in fact, with our community science water project, they were not collecting water quality data for a series of maybe six, seven years. And so we jumped in and started doing that. And so we're, we're, um, for that reason, we, um, we we have some policy wins. One of them was that um, we wanted the um, the water board to keep monitoring the Salton Sea. Um, they stopped at about 2016, and then really formally about 2019, 2020, and then all the way up until just recently this year, they they didn't do any um, water quality monitoring. And this whole huge sea that's you know eight miles wide, 35 miles long, um, biggest lake in California, and they weren't doing any water quality monitoring. Now they are, and I don't want to attribute it to our group, but we were at the state water board meeting and we had our youth and our community up on the stage. 
um, talking. You know, I remember we had our community scientists sitting there talking in front of the the California Water Board, and this is a this is a big group. You know, California is a huge state, and they're sitting there talking about their challenges and you know the water that they're monitoring in front of all the California Water Board lawyers and all the Water Board members. You know, and they're just speaking about what they're doing. And I think the best way to do anything like this, get the youth involved in the science and then get them going and go to these water board meetings and talk. Uh, there's this guy that we work with. He's a local scientist there. His name's Cruz. And he's at this state water board meeting. I think if you look at our website, saltandseascience.org, we have some videos and there's one of them of that water board meeting of him talking. And um, it's on a YouTube, but you can kind of see the, the effectiveness there. So that was one of our policy wins, I think. Um, you know, there there's other policy um, wins that w we have, like now with our hydrogen sulfide monitoring, we are kind of demonstrating that we need to do this monitoring. And so we put the monitors out there. And we also demonstrated that we need monitoring in this community called North Shore. And so now the air quality district is actually installing, they might've already installed it and just not brought it online yet, but an air monitor. So it's kind of like this method of working alongside with the agencies and sort of demonstrating what you want them to do and say, hey, look, we can do it. We launch a boat from a muddy shore. You guys certainly can do it. And so they do. And, um, and you know, then they start monitoring it. There's challenges and there's crit critiques and everything, but I think just demonstrating the path and saying that community can do this or um, or others can do this, um, those really get the, the the challenge met. Now, there's a lot of other things coming up with the Salton Sea that are even beyond those two things about just installing a monitor or whatever. You know, the Salton Sea is now the the there's a there's a new agreement which is taking even more water away from the Salton Sea, and that's much more complicated. Um, and so we're trying to be in those discussions and we're trying to highlight community and say about, look at these health studies that are done about Playa, about the drink, about the water. You know, when you draw more water out of the Salton Sea, you're going to have, um, you're going to have it to concentrate more of the contaminants and have more of these issues that come up. You just really just keep going and keep trying to follow and eventually get to the point where Alianza is now, which they're, you know, they forever were trying to follow all of these different things that legislators were doing, like elected people were trying to do. But now, instead of doing that, what they realized is that they're actually forming the narrative and they're like proposing how they want their future to look. So they have a whole trail that they've proposed and we're going right along with that. And we're trying to do the science around like if people are exposed to the water near the trail, what's going to happen? And we're, they've you know, have these conceptual diagrams and proposals and they're trying to get EPA money, but they're actually pushing the envelope. And so that is a great way to win as well. Instead of like standing back and responding and responding and guiding, you know, you eventually get to the point where you're trying to lead. And that's what I think is a true um, success for um, doing community science. That's that's great. So that's the ultimate success metric would be to, to lead yeah. in these areas and i think the other point you mentioned earlier that i want to highlight is the value of community science is really being able to show the science being done by the community with two agencies and other other more traditional forms of science and and um is that fair to say that that's part of oh, the value yeah. or what the value that's that's the fun part about it is you do the science and, you know, it's science is always kind of insular and, you know, I'm, I'm in the lab right now and we work in the lab and we don't interface and you get turned into kind of a nerd. But when you get out and do it in the field and you get other people and other people around you that are really interested, then, um, then, you know, that really extends the science out and then you can talk about it in a public forum. And, um, and, you know, I think you'll make a lot of friends and a few, only a few enemies, not really, and uh, a lot of friends. And people are usually really excited, especially if they hear that local youth are using words like TMDL and um, you know uh, nutrients, and they're talking about um, the YSI and salinity and all of these technical things. And um, these are these are youth. They're like maybe you know eleventh graders talking about this stuff. So it's it's really great, and that's the that's a way to get that um, rapport with the agencies. Now, Salton Sea, though, 
the complicated agency issues around it is just immense. Also on our website, we have like this super Venn diagram of all these different agencies. There's so many agencies. You have pest, yeah. uh, the California Department of Pest Control. Um, you have the, the Air Resources Board. You have the South Coast Air, AQMD, uh, Air Quality Management District. You have the Water Board. I'm not going to list them all, but major players and Bureau of Reclamation, you have federal and state agencies. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's complicated, but I still think it's totally worth it. And it's, you know, the thing that I really thrive on is getting these, ex these um, experiences going with, with locals where I learn things with them. You have to kind of be excited about the science and then actually learning with them. And now I'm learning things from some of our community sciences that have actually moved on to university. We have Alejandra who moved on to, she's a PhD student at Brown studying the Salton Sea and she's from the Salton Sea region. We have Diego who's a scientist studying the Salton Sea and he's from North Shore um, and he's at the UCLA doing a PhD in civil environmental engineering. And then we have also Cruz that I talked about earlier. And he's also at, um, at UCLA. So it's just really great to get the people from there to start studying it as well as my students as well. I can bring my students from Loma Linda down and we also work with community and have, have pretty good experiences. That's that's impressive really to see how you've brought youth into it as well as doing the policy work for something like this in community science and really getting to learn from the community yourself. So I guess, you know, um, there's so many more things I could ask you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up with what, um, what unanswered questions do you still have? What's next? And what gives you hope? Any one of those. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Well, we have our, our project now and it's on um, hydrogen sulfide and kind of the experiences of this air quality issue. It's an aesthetic, but also there's public health impacts from being exposed to hydrogen sulfide. We don't quite understand the science of like how it's developed. We don't know exactly where it comes from. We know it's like near the Salton Sea, there's so many different questions about its origin. Also, the Salton Sea is, I think, one of the only um, saline lakes that does this thing. It's called a gypsum bloom. It's pretty fascinating. Um, so sulfur will be on the bottom and you'll have these anoxic conditions from all the eutrophication and the nutrients, you know, as they fall down on the bottom. But then um, the, the sulfur will come up to the top and it, it will uh, sometimes, for whatever reason, instead of coming out as hydrogen sulfide, it forms this gypsum green color throughout the whole sea. And so it's pretty fascinating and it's not understood very well. So those are some things that we're still understanding and they have public health impacts. I mean, there's so much, so much science at the Salton Sea and there's room for so many people to work on it. So I, I just wanna end with that, I guess, is that, um, you know, with these, you know, some people say it's a good indicator of what's to come with climate change. And it certainly is, you know, there's a lot of things you'll see at the Salton Sea that are gonna come with climate change. But it's also a really good um, case study for how to work with community. I've really learned so much from working with the community. And when you spend, like I've spent probably over 10 years now working with them, you see people you meet in high school and now they're leaders. Um, not only the ones at the PhD program, there's people that are working in agencies in like water districts. There's people working in the, some of the nonprofits and, and um, even leading university labs. So it's kind of neat to see the whole, um, uh, spectrum of of this and you know you just go in there and you carry your enthusiasm for the topics and then you'll you know and you just keep consistent and then you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to you know have a successful uh, career in, in motivating people to do science and stay in the sciences amazing and with that i will just say thank you so much for being on the show and thank you to our audience for watching. Remember that science really truly does belong to all of us in the community. And um, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much.